Okay, so our last speaker of the conference uh, is uh, Professor Shirley Liu, or Xiao Le Liu, whichever way you want. Uh, yeah, she is currently a professor of computational biology and biostatistics at the Department of Biostatistics uh, in Harvard Medical, Harvard School of Public Health, and also Dana Faber Cancer Institute. Uh, she uh, graduated, uh, uh, got bachelor degree from Smith College, and then went on to uh, Stanford to get uh, a degree, a PhD in uh, I don't even remember medical informatics program. And I was fortunate uh, to be one of her co-advisors at that time when I was still at Stanford. Then uh, after I moved to Harvard, he, she also moved to Harvard and then later became a faculty in the School of Public Health. And then she has been there ever since. Uh, as, uh, it has always been very uh, stimulating and uh, exciting to collaborate with her. And over the many years, we have written many papers together. And recently, she has briefly and successfully got, got involved, got into this area of immunology and also cancer immunology in particular. And I was also fortunate to have uh, been involved as well and uh, have uh, participated in some interesting projects. And today she will tell us uh, something about the uh, cancer immunology insights. Okay, welcome. Okay, yeah, thank you, June, for the kind introduction. So, uh, yeah, I was very lucky to have June as my PhD advisor. He used to debug my code <laughs> when I was a PhD student, and we continue to collaborate. And today the work I will discuss is also part of the collaboration with June. Um, yeah, so um, we know cancer immunotherapy has really brought paradigm shifts to cancer treatment. And also last year, the developers of the early cancer immunotherapy expert, they have uh, won the Nobel Prize in medicine. And we started working on cancer immunology about five years ago. And at the time, we kind of educated ourselves about the basic immunology because it's really, really complex. And so I want to also give you kind of the toned down version of why cancer immunotherapy works. So in our body, um, immune cells such as T cells and B cells are like guards, um, and they have receptors on the cell surface, which is in here. You can see these are receptors. And they constantly look at um, all the cells passing by um, to see whether they are self or non-self. So anything that's like a, basically anything that's self will never allow to circulate in the body. They kind of get eliminated. So our T cells get matured in the thymus and our B cells get matured in the bone marrow. And um, anything that like T cell or B cell that has a receptor which recognize ourselves are eliminated. Um, otherwise, you will have autoimmune. But anything in the blood that's circulating is supposed to recognize foreign antigen. And so all of our normal cells routinely also use this MHC uh, complex to present all the degraded protein onto the cell surface, allowing the guards to examine it and see whether there's something wrong. So imagine if there is a viral infection or if the cancer has a mutation, which will create a mutated peptide, which looks different from our normal uh, peptides. The immune cells will be able to recognize this, oh sorry, is, is able to recognize this as kind of the bad guys and uh, eliminate any cells that carry this. Unfortunately, as we age, actually um, our thymus will eventually, kind of after puberty, it, it, it disappears. And so most of the T cells you get are like the diversity of the T cells are coming from um, like before, like around the time of puberty. And as we get older, if some of these T cells die and say they are supposed to recognize a specific mutation and they're gone, you are likely to have a mutation that accumulate over time without being recognized by the immune cell. In addition, the, the cancer cell can become very sneaky on the cell surface that they express this kind of ligand which can interact with receptors on the T cells and make the T cells not does the killing job. Effectively, you can imagine um, this cancer cell is kind of bribing the, the guard with alcohol and say, hey, buddy, we are friends, right? We're, I'm not so foreign. And so very often in the tumors, you will see the immune cells right next to the cancer cell, and yet they are not doing the killing job. And so what immunotherapy is really doing is they, uh, 
there are therapeutically developed antibodies that can really block the interaction between PDL1, so these ligands, and the, the receptors on the T cells, effectively like pouring ice water onto the drunken guards and wake them up. And once they wake up, they'll be back on job, and hopefully they will quickly recognize that this is foreign and uh, being able to eliminate that. And that's how immunotherapy work. And so um, in order to really see why, you know, like immuno, yeah, so this is eliminating tumor, but um, in order to really understand uh, what kind of T cells or B cells can recognize the tumor antigen as foreign, um, people are very interested in the T cell receptors and B cell receptors in the tumor. And so we have two copies of DNA, one from mom and one from dad, so only two copies. How can we recognize millions of different virus or bacteria or, uh, you know, like mutations that are different. This is uh, through a process called the VDJ recombination. So this is on the T cells. Um, there is a gene segment. Basically, um, these are the Vs, and the, the orange are the Ds, and the blues are the Js. There are many copies of slightly different sequences. And um, VDJ recombination is a DNA recombination process. Basically, the cell will randomly pick, uh, this is in, in um, T cells will randomly pick a V and a D and a J and try to stitch them together. And the closest VDJ will be able to make a productive T cell receptor. And so in this case, um, there is a recombination that creates the diversity. Also, every time you cut the DNA, you try to stitch them together, the, the, the junction sites is not precise, so this yellow location here, they create additional nucleotide, small insertions, deletions, and mutations. And so basically, this is where you create a huge diversity. We can have 10 to the 10th or 12th different type of T cell receptor. Um, each individual, we are able to produce millions or tens of millions of different T cells, but theoretical upper limit from the whole population is like 10 to the 10, huge percent, like uh, numbers. And so this creates the diversity. And the most diverse sequence is this CDR3, the uh, complementary um, uh, determination region number three. This really creates the diversity, and that's really what's expressed on the T cell receptor in, the, in, in front of the T cells, or on the, self, the surface of the T cell, which is responsible for recognizing the antigen on the cancer cells or, 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 or viruses or bacteria. Um, so this is on T cells. B cells are also um, going through this VDJ recombination. And uh, this is the figure for the VDJ. So this is a V, D, and J. You can see it looks slightly different. But again, there is a VDJ recombination, and the closest VDJ uh, will be able to make an antibody. And this is what Zhiping also mentioned in the previous uh, talk. And so on the, sorry, on, on this antibody, which is Y-shaped, the really hypervariable sequence here is responsible for recognizing the different antigens or the, the bad guys. Whereas the constant region in here is responsible for calling different help. For example, if you call 911, there's police, there's fire station, uh, firefighter, and there's the ambulance, right? So the different constant regions are responsible for different immune signaling. And uh, again here, the B cells with the highest affinity against all the cell proteins are eliminated, and the remaining circulating antibodies in the body, and also the circulating B cells in the body, are poised to recognize any foreign antigens, um, including the, the new antigens or the mutated sequences in cancer. And so, in general, um, we want to kind of figure out what is in the, sorry, what are the T cell receptors and B cell receptors in the tumor because they are important to understand what kind of mutations in the tumor generate an immune response. Unfortunately, for TCR sequencing and BCR sequencing, they are quite expensive. Um, you, this is the rough cost from commercial solutions. In addition to being expensive, they consume valuable tumor tissue. So when you get a tumor biopsy, you know, you use this for, you know, pathology staining, you use it for DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, and then whatever is left might be very little material to do this type of TCR or BCR sequencing. And so we hope that we could do this, you know, as a computational biologist, our goal is to do things cheaper so that we can, uh, help you know, using computation to reduce the cost of the experiment. And in this case, we want to do this for free. And this is because 
there are uh, experimental studies already generating tumor RNA sequencing data to look at gene expression in the tumors. And so uh, this RNA sequencing have high throughput you know, reads available. Theoretically, the T cells and B cells in the tumor, when they are expressing T cell receptor and B cell receptors, they create the RNA-seq reads that we should theoretically see from the, the, the tumor bulk RNA-seq data. Unfortunately, uh, one complication exists. Remember, this is the original reference genome that have the V, D, and J segment. But after VDJ recombination, the actual productive RNA-seq read has this junction sequence. And because of the small insertion, deletion, and mutations, you know, it could be that the read can map to the V region, maybe it can map to the J region, but this middle region is very short and also it doesn't really exist in the reference genome. It's not in the mom and dad copy because of the, the random junction sequence here. And so as a result, once you get the tumor RNA-seq reads, all the reads that really map to the receptor sequences, uh, when you try to map the reads into the reference genome, we, the algorithm can't find a place to, to, to put it back into the genome. So all of these reads are, are kind of thrown out as trash cans, I mean, as, as, as just garbage. And so what we did instead is to actually identify those reads. Um, if say one, because most of the reads are paired end, if one end is mapped to the V or to the J or even to the constant region and the other read is unmappable, we suspect that they might be mapping to this hypervariable region. And so we take all of those reads that are kind of thrown into the uh, trash can and say, do they have the, 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 the constant, like uh, the variable, like this V and J sequence patterns. And then we do de novo assembly to really assemble the, uh, to, to see whether they are similar. And then with enough reads overlap, we can then assemble out this um, CDR3 sequence. Um, and so in the previous uh, version of our algorithm, we were able to assemble the uh, TCR reads. And recently, we're also able to assemble the BCR reads. And so this is from a recent paper that from the, ba basically, um, they are in the public, there, there's a major project called the TCGA, where people have sequenced uh, 10,000 tumor RNA-seq data. So we can get those information. The data is publicly available. And uh, in order to really test whether our algorithm work well, we took the same tumor, so these are um, different, uh, yeah, we took some tumors, basically um, half of this tumor we sent to just regular RNA-seq. The other uh, slice of tumor we sent for BCR sequencing, the expensive one. And then we, we want to ask if we just use RNA-seq plus this trust algorithm. By the way, RNA sequencing nowadays is dirt cheap. It's like three, four hundred dollars, much cheaper than BCR uh, sequencing. And then compare with this more expensive BCR sequencing, we can ask what is the precision and also the sensitivity of the CDR3 calling, as well as the precision and sensitivity of the constant region, calling the, the, the you know, whether it's calling the, firefighters or the, the ambulance or the police. Um, you, you might say that, you know, so basically when this clone is very abundant, we can get a really accurate result. If it's less and less abundant, then we may not have as good a result. And you know, in here, you know, like 50% may not look very good. The fact is, if you even have a single drop of blood, you split it in two, and each you do the BCR sequencing, they will not give you 100% overlap because sometimes that TCR only appear once, and you take it from the left side of the drop, it's not in the right drop. So this is already actually a very accurate result. And um, recently within the lab, we are developing the fourth version of this algorithm. Um, you can see the speed is much faster. We take um, less memory. And previously, from each tumor, we get about two, 3,000 tumor from, from the same data. Now we can get like 5,000 antibody sequences. Um, and also you can see the precision on overall accuracy is also improving. In addition, you know, previously we can only get the CDR3 sequence out, and now we can get the full V sequence, the full uh, CDR3 sequence, the full J sequence, as well as the constant region. Basically, we can assemble a full-length antibody sequence from the read overlap. So we are getting you know, more and more towards the actual antibody in the tumors. 
And so with this, you know, we want to actually look at the biology in the tumor. What are really the antibodies in the tumor? For example, this is one example. From the same patient tumor, we see many of these CDR3 clones. They share a lot of nucleotides that are similar, except for some positions in here. You might think that these are B cells coming from you know, blood all homing into the tumor, but it's, it's highly unlikely that it's coming from initially different B cells. Instead, what we suspect is happening is once you have one B cell that goes to the tumor and they recognize this tumor having an antigen, it will create a local factory called a germinal center. And so basically the B cell will locally produce more copies of the B cells. And in the process, um, there is a protein called AID which will create additional mutations on these hypervariable sequence. And so this way, um, that it can evolve antibodies with even better recognition to the antigen. And so basically, um, once the antibody recognizes the antigen, it can proliferate, and then it will evolve, and only the ones with better specificity against the antigen will get to proliferate even more, and then evolve even better antibodies. So it's kind of a local evolution happening. And so the fact that we see all of these sequences with very similar sequence is an indication that indeed in the tumors, the B cells are recognizing some antigen and doing the clonal expansion. And how do we know what we are seeing is real clonal expansion, not some errors in the algorithm or errors in experiments such as sequencing error or PCR amplification bias? Um, we look at this by looking at all those somatic hypermutations that we identified in the tumor. And you can see there is a three base pair periodicity here. Uh, this is because um, every three nucleotide corresponds to one amino acid. And out of the three nucleotide, the first two nucleotide are very important for the amino acid. The third nucleotide, it doesn't really matter so much. And so the third base in the tumor, as it, it, it mutates, can, can be, there's no selection going on. Whereas the first two, amino, uh, first two nucleotide, there's very strong selection. So the fact that we see this three base pair periodicity actually told us what we're seeing is real rather than you know, some experimental artifact. And also it suggests that there is very strong selection pressure in the tumor to select the antibodies with better specificity against the antigen. In addition, we see that the tumors with higher expression of this AID protein, which creates the somatic hypermutation. So if the tumor have higher AID expression, this tumor also harbor more somatic hypermutation, suggesting that these are indeed real B cell trying to evolve in better antibodies. Um, and so we mentioned that in the tumors, this VDJ recombination creates the, the kind of the recognition of the antigen. But then there is also this constant region which um, can call out a different help. Because most of the TCGA tumor sequencing are done with paired end reads. So very often, um, one end of the read, we can map the VDJ sequence, and the other end, we can see what this antibody is calling. Is it calling the ambulance? Is it calling the firefighters, and so on. And so we will know what kind of antibodies we have. And uh, for example, in breast cancer, we see there are a lot of antibodies with this IgG, you can see that the purple or pink ones, these IgG antibodies. Um, and though they're, they also have more uh, IgA antibodies, IgA1 and IgA2. Um, this is another example for a melanoma. So interestingly, of course, this needs to be validated more. So far, what we have seen is currently with immunotherapy, there are only a number of cancer types that have shown to benefit from current like PD-1 or ctla 4 antibody. Those cancer types that benefit uh, from immunotherapy are those cancer types with more IgG. But if this cancer type have a lot of IgA, they don't seem to benefit from immunotherapy. Another thing we, we notice is um, there are cases when the VDJ sequence is identical or extremely similar, whereas the constant regions are different. This is actually um, a case called uh, IgG class switch. Basically, um, the antibody are switching their constant regions. Um, so what happens in order to create or, or to use these different constant regions is um, when people are young, they have more of these IgM antibodies. But there, there is a process in order to shift to the next kind of the next antibody, the constant region, this piece of DNA will get deleted. 
then it will use this piece. But if this piece is getting deleted, it will use the next constant region. And so there is a DNA deletion process. The antibody initially used all kind of, in, in some sense, instead of 911 calling three help at the same time, it's like you always call the ambulance first or police first. And if the police didn't come, then you, you call the, 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 the fire station, and then you call the ambulance, or, or so on. So there is an order. Initially, it was always I, IgM, then it's like IgG, and then it's IgA. And so we see cases when the antibody is being shifted from the kind of the uh, IgG to IgA. So the, these links actually tell us in different cancer types how much are their class switch happening. So why is this important? Um, previously, sorry, previously, um, when people are looking at what the B cells are doing in the tumor, there is very conflicting results. Some people say that B cells are good for the tumor or the patient. Some people say B cells are bad. So there are actually review papers from a Harvard colleague, uh, Shiv Pillai's lab, showing this uh, love-hate relationship. Indeed, if you look at different cancer types, looking at different cohort, it's all over the place. Um, we can also look at all the TCGA tumor types. Indeed, you can see um, comparing the cancer with the normal, we don't always see consistent trend in terms of the overall B cell infiltration levels. However, there is something that's more consistent, which is, um, in general, the tumor B cells are less diverse. Um, the diversity is decreasing. This is because when a specific B cell clone starts to proliferate, it become more clonal. So the overall diversity actually decreased. In addition, we see a huge enrichment of these constant regions being shifted. And so we see an enrichment of a class switch event. And so what are the class switch really doing in the tumors? Um, so one important way for the tumor to use this class switch constant region is to call out the right killer cells. In this case, the natural killer uh, cell. And so what happens is, for example, if you have a cancer cell that have an antigen, which is being recognized by antibody, um, if it has the right constant region, it will be able to use a receptor called uh, FC gamma receptor or CD16A to get the natural killer cell into the tumor and uh, uh, kill the cancer cells. And so we are trying to find out in the tumors which type of these constant regions, so these are different constant regions, we, we ask which constant region is really calling how the, or correlated with CD16A. So we use the expression level of CD16A as a proxy for natural killer activity. And so if you look at all the different constant regions, what we found is that you know, IgG1 or IgG3, especially if the antibody has this IgG1 or IgG3 class switch, um, there's a huge enrichment or positive correlation with the NK cell activity. Whereas if the antibody have more IgG4 or IgA uh, constant region, then it's actually negatively correlated. It gives us some hint, you know, currently for the uh, immunotherapy, including PD-1, PD-L1, or CTLA-4, they actually have different constant regions. And so now we understand that IgG1 and IgG3, because they bring the natural killer cells here for killing, they are mostly killing antibodies, whereas IgG4 is actually a blocking antibody. Currently, there is no therapeutic antibody that's IgA, um, and we'll, we'll show you why that is the case. And so, uh, so we know that actually the antibodies in the tumor are enriched, right? So they are recognizing the tumor antigen, and so they are bringing in the natural killer cells. We wonder whether the tumor has a way to evade the natural killer cell. Um, so basically, once the natural killer cells are here, there is a receptor called NKG2D. It's kind of a sensor to ask um, what cell is under stress. Natural killer cells come in the tumor to sense what cell is under stress. And the cancer cell express a, a kind of a stress signal called a MIG A to say, I'm under stress. The cancer cell is totally messed up, so it is under some stress. There is MIG A expression, so when the natural killer cell comes there, the sensor sees th this MIG A, then that's a pair. Um, the natural killer cell will start doing the killing. Interestingly, we found 20% of the, the cancer cells overexpress this MIC A gene, which is really strange. You know, why would they wave their flags stronger to, to be killed? Um, it turns out when the MIC A is amplified, there's an enzyme that can cleave the MIC A into a soluble MIC A, and this can be like a shield to push the sensor inside the cell and the, the natural killer cell in the tumor will no longer be able to recognize the, 
the cancer cell under stress. So this is the shield kind of push the sword back into the cell. And, and so um, we see that in general um, in the TCGA tumors, if the MEK is amplified, in general, the patient will have bad survival be, because the cancer cell has ev evolved a mechanism to evade the natural killer cell killing. Interestingly, um, in this case, if the tumor has IgG1 and IgG class switch, those patients actually do better. And so we, we kind of puzzled for a very long time to ask what those antibodies were doing. And so um, our final hypothesis is that actually these antibodies that are doing the IgG1 and IgG class switch might be able to recognize the soluble MeCA and block it so that it cannot push the NKG or internalize the NKG to D, and that actually have protective effect on the patient. In fact, one of my collaborators um, at Dana Farber Cancer Institute are now developing a MeCA antibody to really just block the soluble MeCA so that the NKG to D can really work and kill the cancer cells. And this actually gave us some insight. In the tumors, they are autoantibodies. They recognize the self proteins. Um, and so there are some papers published before showing that there are autoantibody uh, production in the cancer. And um, this is another example uh, in, oh, sorry. Um, in uh, small cell lung cancer, there are also autoantibodies, and you know, that's important potentially for diagnosis, de you know, detection, and also therapy. And recently, there's another paper showing that breast cancer patient with HER2 amplification, 80% of those patients have HER2 autoantibodies in the tumor. Um, and also, there, there are other reports showing that you know, if the patient have B cells, um, that express these autoantibodies against the, the tumor antigens, indeed those tumors may not progress very quickly. So it suggests that the B cells in the tumors, um, once they produce those autoantibodies, it can protect the, uh, the, the, the patient from, you know, have, it can prevent the tumor from further progressing. However, you wonder, you know, even with those antibodies, the tumor still, you know, the patient still develop tumor. You know, it's apparently it's not good enough. Um, we suspect, you know, one possibility is that in the tumor, the antibody amount is not high enough. That's why you need to give the patient additional antibodies to have a therapeutic effect. And there's another potential reason, and this comes from our analysis on the blood tumors. This is acute um, myeloid uh, leukemia. And so, so here we are looking at the leukemia patient uh, as well as the human, like a normal uh, individual, healthy donors. Um, both the uh, infant, uh, children, and, and uh, the adult. Um, so the first thing we notice is, um, oops, sorry. The first thing we notice is, um, we mentioned that it, um, with, for, for antibody, there is this constant region shifting you know, from IgM to IgA. So basically, the antibody can only shift from this side to that side. And if we look at the people over different age group, what we found is that, in general, if the person is young, they have more IgM, even in healthy individuals. And as they, old, as they age, their antibody will be more and more like on the, on the right side. And so you can imagine these are like young antibodies and these are like old antibodies. And uh, interestingly, when the cancer, you know, like in the cancer patient, this shift actually happened much, much earlier. So um, the cancer cell can, can potentially secrete some cytokines to push the antibody to shift from a, a young antibody to an old antibody. And interestingly, that has good clinical um, support. So this is a finding from previous solid tumor in melanoma. So if the patient have more of these old antibodies like AG, IgA, they actually have worse survival. We can also see from the AML patient in the cancer samples, if they have more IgA1 or IgA2, they have much worse survival. Um, so what kind of cytokines can push the cell to a cancer cell to shift or the B cells to shift the antibody? There have been papers before showing that cytokines such as TGF beta can induce the antibody to shift into IgA and that will actually have a immune suppressive effect. So in some sense, you can imagine when the patient have these young antibodies such as um, IgG, 
it is actually calling a police or a uh, like a firefighter to really kill the cancer cells. However, the cancer cell can secrete some cytokine to force the antibody to shift into an IgA antibody. And the IgA antibody is actually helping the cancer cells. Then in some sense, it's, it's not really a killer anymore. It's, 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 it's calling another criminal to, to help the, the cancer cells. And so um, we, we can look into the TCGA tumors or the AML samples. Indeed, you can see uh, when the TGF beta cytokine is high, IgA antibody is much more abundant. And um, we are asking, you know, what is happening here? Um, in this case, we found that when the TGF beta is high, um, Fox P3 is also much, much higher. And this is a, a T reg cell. This is a regulatory T cells. These are actually, in some sense, the so normal T cells are doing the good job of protecting ourselves. T regs are suppressive T cells. And so in some sense, once we have a TGF beta cytokine, antibody are shifted to the old antibody. They actually recruit T reg cells there to suppress the immune system, which will actually help the cancer grow. And so in some sense, the cancer cell can, through its own secretion, can co-opt the B cells to help the tumor grow. And so that's why we thought, Maybe instead of giving the cancer cells B cell, we should just give it antibody because the antibody themselves cannot do the shifting, right? And so um, the first part of the, you know, the talk, you know, the summary is you know, we have this trust algorithm, it's open source, we are gonna try to release the trust four version very, very soon. And uh, this algorithm basically from just the tumor bulk RNA-seq, which only costs like three, four hundred dollars to do, we can infer the tumor infiltrating um, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. These are different you know, T cell receptors. And also um, the heavy chain and light chain um, B cell repertoires. Um, actually, if you wanna do these TCR and the BCR sequencing, each of these is a separate experiment consuming more tissues, whereas with bulk, you get all of them. And we've, from our analysis, we found that actually there are indeed B cells in the tumor and it's the IgG antibodies that are actually doing the protective effect. And there are also a lot of autoantibodies in the tumors. And also we found that you know, cytokines like TGF beta can co-opt the B cells to shift into an IgA antibody, which can then recruit the Tregs and then the, the patient will have actually much worse outcome. And so this uh, is kind of what we are doing in the lab. And so these are the postdocs who are doing the computational work. And also we, this is a collaboration with Jin Liu and my other collaborators. The question is you know, whether we can use this information in treatment or clinical care. And so here I have a disclosure information. I'm a co-founder of a, a biotech therapeutic antibody company called GV20 Oncotherapy. Um, so traditionally, you know, like if somebody wants to develop a, a therapeutic antibody drug, this is what they do. Um, if you are interested in developing antibody against a protein you are interested in, um, there, the, the first approach is called hybridoma. You basically make a purified protein of this gene, or uh, like make a purified protein, you inject them into the mouse or a camel. This is similar to us getting a flu shot. And then you boost, you, 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 you know, a couple weeks later, you add another shot. And so the, the, the animal will develop antibodies against the antigen. And then we take their B cells and we test each of B cell for their presence of the antibody that can potentially recognize the antigen. So this is one approach. There's another approach, which is um, we create a, a huge antibody repertoire with like 10 to the 10th different diversity, many, many different antibodies. And then we create, um, uh, the, we put the target antigen on a magnetic bead, and then basically we mix them so that the antibodies that can recognize this antigen will get enriched, um, and then uh, we iteratively enrich for this, and then uh, identify a couple of binders. So these are potential antibodies against the antigen we're interested in. But in order to develop these into therapeutic antibodies, these are not naturally occurring human proteins. There is a process called a humanization, which you convert a camel or, or a mouse antibody into a human antibody. And in that conversion, there's problems because our genomes are totally different, right? So, and also manufacturing there could be a problem because you want to have high 
uh, production stable antibodies that don't coagulate and things like this. And so in this process, there are a lot of technical problems. And also, you kind of start from just random. You immunize or, or you, you randomly select, and you're hoping that you will get something. Um, instead, um, because of our previous work, we realized actually in the patient tumors, there are a lot of antibodies that have potentially therapeutic effect. In some sense, you know, PD-1 or PD-L1 are antibodies that people actually got from mouse. They do have protective effect. And so we are now developing a deep learning algorithm. Um, actually, it is published now. We have uh, this on BioArchive. And so we develop an algorithm that we can predict which antigen binds, which, which antibody binds to which antigen. And so in order to validate this, we look at three um, uh, commercial like therapeutic antibodies. These are three different PD-1s developed by different companies. And so here um, we're looking at uh, x-axis is our computational prediction of the uh, antigen. Like based on the antibody sequence, we can predict whether it will have a strong binding against PD-1. And the y-axis is kind of uh, the actual binding affinity. So you can see when our score is high, the binding affinity is also higher. By the way, KD, the smaller, the better the antibody specificity. So we can actually predict um, specific antibodies, what their antigen is. And so, of course, we don't want to develop another PD-1 because there are already three available. And so what we want to do is actually to develop like novel antibodies. And so, um, so basically, if we are interested in some target, we can use our computational model to say what antibodies can you predict from, you know, like a, that, that target, this target. And we can use high throughput antibody production. And we generate a very kind of high concentration antibodies. And then um, we can use ELISA or um, flow cytometry to validate indeed the antibody that we predicted are binding to the antigen that we, we are interested in. And this is the positive control of uh, the uh, PD. Uh, the L1 antibody, but these are other antibodies um, that we predicted, including like EGFR antibody, HER2 antibody, you know, PD1, PD L1 that we actually identified from the patient tumors. And there are also additional antibodies that are targeting our, our the, the, the new target that we are interested in. This is a small pool, not just one. We are we, in order to initially test this, we give it a small pool to, to check. And currently we're trying to identify the best binder from that small pool. Uh, this is another um, example. We want to see whether the antibody we, de de we identify from the patient tumor actually have therapeutic effect. And uh, the example is here. This is a mouse tumor called a B16 cell. And we express the EGFR protein here. And, uh, and then we give the patient the antibodies that we predicted to target EGFR. And you can see. Um, when the mice are given those antibodies, indeed the tumor will grow much slower. And so in some sense, in the long run, uh, if people are interested in therapeutic, they shouldn't need to immunize mouse or, or a camel. Instead, you can use computational approach to directly identify antibody from the public patient tumor data to develop therapeutic antibodies. And that's what we are trying to do. Um, so I, Sorry. The, the summary of this is um, actually patient tumors harbor antibodies with potential therapeutic effect. And we developed this deep PCR method, which can predict the, the antigen specific BCRs. And this could be used to accelerate antibody dis discovery for a drug discovery process. And so in the whole talk, I talk about you know, what the tumor RNA seq can give you. Um, so we focus on the, it's the trust part. But actually, once you have the tumor RNA-seq, there are many, many other things you can get. I, the very basic is gene expression. You can also get mutation information from tumor RNA-seq. You can estimate the, the different level of immune cell infiltrations in the tumor. Um, we can also look at whether the tumor has pathogens, like uh, people have finding like virus or bacteria in the tumor. We can use the tumor expression data to predict the immunotherapy response and also predict which of these mutations potentially generate a immune response. And so all of these, um, I would say, there are currently various computational solutions, including some developed by our group. And so um, we are actually trying to string this together into a powerful computational pipeline. If anybody have a big tumor cohorts of like 100 tumors, 
we can use these pipelines to get all of these informations out from, from the, the very inexpensive tumor RNA-seq data now. And so um, it's just a very powerful technology experimentally and with good computation, you can also generate a lot of useful insight. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. What makes uh, this uh, later version of trust uh, more accurate and also faster compared to the uh, version? Okay. Um, I have some other slides which really show this. Uh, um, it's, so, so the first thing is previously we, we required the, the read uh, to have at least a full match or to, to at least a consecutive match to the V and the J. But because somatic hypermutation also happened on the V and J sequence, so now instead of a full pattern matching, we only require that there is like 21 nucleotide similarity, like a match, even if there are gaps. And the second one is after we identify the candidate reads, we sort them based on their abundance. And so the really abundant one will dominate in the assembly. So then, which I think is the right way to do. So previously trust, depending on how you, you know, the order the sequence you input, it was greedy. You know, the first read coming in, it will, will start to assemble. The second read coming in, it will start to assemble and align with everything else. So now, um, after we find those candidate reads, we sort them and then start the assembly from the most abundant reads. And then it actually is much, much faster. And also, you want to assemble the abundant one. Um, the third one is uh, we try to use the more information on the paired and the sequencing information to really assemble the CDR1 and CDR2. And that's why we can, we can get better results now. Um, the three um, nucleotide periodicity is really beautiful to see. I wonder if you use that information in your algorithm of assembly. We, we didn't use this at all. Would it help? Ah, I'm not um, saying you did use, I'm just saying could you use it? I see. Uh, it's a good question. Um, so I guess we could because there are certainly some uh, BCR sequence that are not productive. Basically, at the end, the CDR3 is not in a, a three not at in all. Frame. Right, not in frame at all. Those will also, I guess, then we can use it to eliminate those non-productive sequences as well. Yeah, we can, we can use it to improve the construction. And also, like the switching, I'm actually very intrigued by the um, type of switching. Uh -huh. study. Yeah. I, I thought IgM was actually a octamer or? Uh, 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 five. Pentamer. Pentamer, yeah. So, so IgM is the naive B cells. Correct. So uh, most of, you know, the, in our body, we have a lot of IgM, especially when people are young. But when you, it, people are old, then they have more IgA. And also in all of our mucosal tissues, basically our mouth, you know, our, our, all, the whole gut, our lung have more IgA. Mm -hmm. This is because whatever you eat, you don't want to get inflamed on things that are, they, they don't really matter. So the mucosal tissues are covered with IgA. And the cancer cells, in some sense, we have this hypothesis, the cancer cell is pretending to be the gut and say, hey, I'm just the food you eat, don't kill me, right? Yeah. And so they, 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 the tumor get coated with the IgA, then the T cells doesn't go in to try to, to do killing anymore. And so we suspect that actually some of these antibodies do recognize the tumor antigens, but then the cancer cell secretes the, the cytokine to change their warhead from an IgG to an IgGA. Yeah. Hi, uh, I, I want to ask some details about the deep learning. What other features you used? Ah, so um, for example, um, every amino acid has some properties, you know, the, the shape, the charge, whether they have a ring on the amino acid. Um, and then also we use different k-mers to see, you know, whether some k-mers are similar. So for example, in our deep learning, if we start training knowing nothing about the property of the amino acid, after the training, we can see like a blossom matrix to say, okay, this amino acid actually looks similar to some other amino acid. 
Um, we look at k-mers, we look at the ordering of the k-mers, and also we, we do model the constant regions as well. Um, yeah, so that's also useful. Uh, uh, currently, actually for an antibody to happen, you have the heavy chain and there's also the two light chain. We're also trying to add the light chain modeling into here. And so this way you can really get the correct antibody sequence. But um, interestingly for antibody, most of the specificity come from the heavy chain. Light chain help only a little bit, doesn't help too much. Uh, is that possible to use a machine learning algorithms like SVN or Gradient Distribution? Uh, it's hard because it's, uh, like if you really want to see whether like you and me share any antibody, we sequence a drop of blood, almost zero overlap. You really have to just kind of uh, look at, because we have 30 million antibodies to train, that's how we can look at the properties that are shared. Oh, 30 million is the sequence length or the? 30 million is different sequences. Each is a different antibody clone. Yeah, because from the 10,000 tumors, we have a lot to train from. Last question, what are you predicting with the deep learning network? Um, so we are predicting two things. The first thing we are trying to predict is based on the antibody repertoire, can you tell what cancer type it is? Um, indeed, uh, actually for some cancers, we have excellent predictive power. Just looking at the antibodies in the tumor, we'll know this is like gastric cancer or that's ovarian cancer. And so currently we are doing an experiment to test for these cancers, can we see those antibodies in the blood? And if so, maybe that can be used as early detection approach. And the second one is we are trying to predict whether this antibody recognizes a PD-1. You know, what antigen does it? Does it recognize HER2? Does it recognize this meek a that we showed? And, and there, um, then we have to do the experiment again to test indeed whether the antibody recognized the antigen we predicted. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I want to ask, so uh, did you try some uh, single cell based uh, uh -huh. approaches to improve the uh, uh, prediction? Um, so currently, if you just do single cell, uh, say BCR sequencing, um, so you have to, basically you can't use the bulk tumor. You can't even use the single cell suspension. You have to do the single cell suspension and really sort just the B cells before you can put them on the single cell sequencing machine. This machine currently allow you to load up to 10, uh, let me think, up to 10,000 cells per run. And of course, it's also an even more ex expensive experiment. And basically you will sequence, I would say at the maximum, a few thousand B cells. But there are many B cells that will be sharing the same sequence. And so at the end, you will probably get maybe only a thousand different clones. But in this case, we are just doing bulk RNA-seq and we're getting 5,000 clones already from, from the data. For T cells, we don't get so much um, because T cells, all the receptors are only expressed on the cell surface. Whereas with B cells, once the B cell recognize the antigen, it will make the local factory to really massively produce antibodies. And the, the antibodies initially will appear on the cell surface, but when they are enough, they also get released on the outside. And that's the real antibody you see circulating in your body. They are free floating antibodies. And because of that, the B cells that produce them make a lot more antibody that we can see from the RNA-seq. And so I would say for T cell receptor, um, if you sort the T cells and then run single cell RNA-seq, you might get more than what we get. You know, we get, I would say, three, 500 TCRs per tumor. But for B cells, I don't think they will ever get as many. Uh, the nice thing about B cell uh, repertoire is they can know the heavy chain, light chain pairing. In, the, in our case, because we get the bulk, we can't pair the heavy chain with light chain. Um, but you know, in order to accumulate 10,000 single cell RNA-seq sample, it will take a very long time. So we are waiting for public to generate the data and we can just analyze it. We're not gonna spend that much money to generate the data. 
Uh, okay, so uh, how do you think the next step for uh, the uh, research related to this area? Because currently we are, we, we, are, we are already able to make predictions for, for the BCR. And um, so I can tell you that, uh, uh, by the way, the second part is done in the company that we have now. We are recruiting people with machine learning <laughs> expertise. You are welcome to be an intern or you know, like to work for us. Um, we can tell you that the current machine learning algorithm is not perfect. When we have the antibodies and we test, we can use CRISPR screens to test whether the antibody is specific or, or the pool. We were testing the small pool. And we know that our current prediction is not perfect. And so we are also generating more data because every time when we test the antibody, we generate additional high throughput data which we then feed into the, the deep learning model to improve the antibody prediction. So I think that the, the deep BCR can still be drastically improved with additional samples. Um, uh, so for example, this was only built on uh, 10,000 TCGA tumors. ICGC has another 4,000 tumors, and also in the public, you look at the geo, there are I think another uh, 3,000 publicly available tumors, and we are also trying to get more tumor RNA seeked from you know, proprietary sources. Okay, yeah. What do you mean level? Great. Oh, with, uh, from RNA-seq, yes, I think so. But from antibody, I'm not so sure. Uh, uh, and this on the gene, you have used to Ah, yeah, absolutely. There are people, you know, with the t tumor slide, you, you do a pathology slide, yes, absolutely. You can use it to get a tumor stage, yes. Yeah, but that's more for a kind of diagnosis, not really for therapeutic treatment. Um, and also, you know, actually our lab are very genomics focused. We look at mostly sequencing data. So we, we haven't looked into that, but yeah, there are definitely there are people looking at images to get tumor stage and uh, diagnosis. Oh, um, so, um, the, the company we have, we have two different approaches. Basically, uh, we first use CRISPR screening to identify which gene is a good target. Um, we do have right now some novel targets that we know are important for, say, the natural killer cells or macrophage properties in the cancer that we know are important. We have functional validation assays for those. But basically, as I mentioned, in, in pharmaceutical companies, when you have a target, you still have to either kind of you know, immunize the mice or camels to generate an antibody or um, kind of uh, use this phage display to identify antibody. There are a lot of other assays that has to be done. But then once you have to convert this from a camel or, or, or mouse antibody to a human, there could be additional problems. So in this case, because our CRISPR screen can identify m multiple targets, right? We ask, which of those do we have a deep learning model to predict at the, at the binders? and we directly synthesize those to test. Um, there are also some an, uh, antigens that are very, very difficult to make. For example, um, ion channels or GPCRs because there's this antibodies like, you know, in, this is the cell membrane. They're inside, outside all the time. And so it's hard to really construct a good recombinant protein that you can shoot into, you know, like inject into the animals. Those are very difficult to make therapeutic antibodies. So now we are also trying to see whether we can predict antibodies against those that, uh, we, can, that, that we can develop into uh, a good, you know, like a potential therapeutic antibodies. 